So let's go to the, uh, the, the class today. Uh, last week, we discussed the electron guns. Today, we'll move to the electromagnetic lenses. Before looking at the electromagnetic lenses, let's revisit the schematic of SEM. Uh, again, I expect you can draw that um, at the end of the class. So we have the column here. On the top, we have the specimen chamber here on the bottom. So that's the general shape of an SEM. What we discussed last week was the electron gun. The bits on the very top. Also, last week we said there are different lenses in the column. We just draw them out first, then name them. In the chamber, that's where we mount the uh, specimen. So this is the sample you want to look at. In nearly every SEM, you have the SE detector. You have the secondary electron detector. Let's just call detector here for now. You also learned when we shoot electron beam or we focus the electron probe on the specimen, it will generate signals and the signals are collected by the detector. That's how SEM forms images. Back to the, uh, the lens systems we have here. So the first kind of like first set of coils you see here is called condenser lens. The second set of coils you see here, those are the scanning coils. The third set of lenses you see here, it's called the objective lens. There are three kind of like lenses or coils we have in the, uh, in the column. Let's quickly describe what they do. For the condenser lens, as the name suggests, it condenses the beam. Why you want to condense the beam in the first place? Why you want to converge the beam into a spot? Any comments from students? Smaller spot size or like spot diameter. Exactly, yeah. So SEM, what we, want, what we want to do is to converge the beam to a spot to scan on the specimen. So we need a lens to converge or condense the beam. Very good. Then after the condenser lens, we have the scanning coil. That's where SEM gets the other name. When we converge the beam into a spot, or a disc to be more precise, then we need to rest the beam across the specimen surface. So the scanning coil does the scanning. Um, I'll give you some random, random fact. For human eyes, maybe you think the eyeballs stay stable, but actually when we see things, the reason why we have a pretty wide field of view is because our eyeballs are actually scanning at very high speed. So it's somewhat similar to, uh, to SEM. The difference is in SEM, the electron beam is converged into a probe, into a disk, it does scanning. When we scan, the light, the photons are actually coming from all different directions. All right move to uh, the objective lens. The purpose of having objective lens is to focus. The aim is to focus the image. 
on LESEM, you have a knob either called focus, like in the FEI, or Zeiss instruments, or it's called working distance on the test scan instruments. When you put the other sample in, in most of the cases, the image is blurry. Then you turn the, uh, the focus knob to bring the image into focus. What you are actually doing is to change the strength of the objective lens to bring the image into focus. So those are the functions of the three sets of coils or, and the lenses you have in the column. To be more specific, if you look at the names, we have the condenser lens. We have the objective lens. Therefore, SEM is a two lens system. We have like a regular magnifying glass. You hold that over like a bug or over something to look at, uh, try to magnify, uh, which are trying to see. This is a single lens system, but in SEM, as well as in modern microscopes, optical microscopes, you have multiple lenses. For SEM, specific, uh, for SEM specifically, it has the condenser lens and the objective lens, so it's a two lens system. Any questions so far about the instrumentation before we move on? Um, sorry, I didn't quite understand the scanning coil's purpose. Mm, okay. If we only have the conden condenser lens and the objective lens, then what we see is just one disk or one spot on the specimen. And that's all. In order to form an image, we need the scanning coil to raster, like to deflect the beam. So the beam will scan on the specimen. In SEM, at each pixel, you generate information and the information is collected by the detector. So the scanning coil deflects the beam that allows the beam to scan on the specimen surface that gives you the image. Without scanning coil, it will be just one really focused and the narrow beam on the specimen. So does this answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, cool. All right. So let's look at the, uh, the few things we can play with the lens system to, to see what these things will affect the image quality. There's one thing I forgot to mention. Uh, this is important. So let me just write that down. In both SEM and TEM, the, the electron beam never travels straight down. Instead, the electron beam actually spirals down. And eventually will hit the, uh, the specimen will not cover the details of the electromagnetic lenses here in the class, but I want you to know that as a fact, when we deal with the electromagnetic lenses, the beam never, the, the beam never travels straight there. Instead, it spirals there. However, however, in our geometric ray diagrams, we'll draw like uh, the, 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 the ray diagrams you saw back in high school, as well as first year in first year physics, Undergraph physics will use straight beam to give you the approximation. So the important thing is in SEM, and the TEM, the beam or the electron beam spirals there. However, we'll use straight lines.
for the array diagrams. The beam spiraling down will not really affect what you see in SEM, but in TEM, if you take the TEM class in the spring semester, there's one artifact or quote unquote artifact from TEM imaging. When you increase the magnification, the image you see on the camera actually rotates. This is called magnetic rotation. The magnetic rotation is the result of electron beam spiraling down. When you zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, we increase magnification, you're actually looking at different sections of the, uh, the beam in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the optical system. And when you move up or move down, the image actually rotates because the beam spirals there. The second thing I want to tell you is people usually think TEM is very, very difficult. Uh, it is difficult, but if you understand SEM, you know nearly half of the TEM. The reason is because the top part, the condenser lens and the objective lens, these two systems are identical to what people use in TEM. The difference between SEM and the TEM in terms of number of lens systems is in SEM, you have condenser lens and objective lens. In TEM, you have one more lens system underneath. This is called projector lens or intermediate lens. For TEM, what you do is, uh, what you do is to add one more lens system after the objective lens. Okay, now let's look at what we can play in terms of this beam optics to control or fine tune certain optical properties or opti optical outputs such as resolution. So let's look at two things. So let's call those input or inputs. There are two things we'll look at. The first is the strength of condenser lens. The second is working distance. Let's look at output. For most people who use SEM, you want to get really nice images. So naturally, the first thing to look at is resolution. The question is, what if we change the strength of the condenser lens? For example, if we increase the strength of the condenser, condenser lens, are we improving resolution or are we degrading resolution? Naturally, the second question, if we increase the working distance, are we improving the resolution or are we degrading the resolution? In an image, resolution is not the only output you're looking for. Let's look at a few more other examples. Sometimes you may be interested in the depth of field. So depth of field. In many cases, the things you see are not flat. Can we bring these non-flat features, all of them into focus? Or you want to only focus on certain things, any certain features, anything that's not on the same focal plane, you want them to be blurry. A good example is when you use the latest iPhone, you can use the portrait mode. You only want the person in front of the camera to be in focus. You don't want like, you know, people or things behind the person in focus. By doing that, we actually reduce the depth of the, uh, depth of the field or depth of focus. The third thing we're interested in is is that going to change the signal to noise ratio? We'll emphasize signal to noise ratio again and again, because anything we do, we get data. Data can data contain information and the noise. We want to differentiate the meaningful results, meaningful information from the random noise. The first thing we're gonna look at is, what if we change the strength of the condenser lens. Let's draw the uh, 
the geometric ray diagrams. So, effects of the strength of condensed lens. Assume we have the uh, electron gun here, that's the electron source. On the right-hand side, we do the same thing. I hope you remember, uh, let's construct the other system first, then I'll discuss more on that. Then after the electron gun, we have the condenser lens. Instead of drawing the lens in the lenticular shape of this use a rectangle box, bring that to the center. Actually, I'm going to copy this. Okay. So this is the condenser lens. I'll just say CL. And after the condenser lens, we have the objective lens. And this is O L objective lens. And underneath we have the specimen. So this is the sample. Let's look at the uh, first case. Um, I hope you remember in the last lecture we mentioned, we can never converge the uh, electron beam into a single spot. We always get a disk. And also we mentioned different electron sources. They have different um, kind of different sizes. So we have the, um, we have the, uh, the Gaussian disk. In imaging, what we see when we follow the, uh, the, the, the geometric ray diagram, what we see if we converge the beam into the smallest possible disk is actually an image of the filament itself. I hope it makes sense. Like if you have something blunt, you try to convert that into a disk. Then what you see in the disk is that blunt tip you see from the thermionic gun. If you have something sharp, such as like a bag, then using optics, you convert that into a smallest possible, possibly smallest uh, disk. What you see is the fat gun tip image. So for simplicity, we can just assume this is the shape of the gun. We'll do the same thing here. Try to make them the same size. Assuming we have the same guns in both systems, the only thing we're going to change is the strength of the condenser lens. From high school physics, if you have the beam going down straight like that, through the, uh, the center of the optical axis, the beam is not deflected. So it will just travel straight down. I hope that makes sense. And if we have the electron beam coming out from the tip and going down like that, the lens will bend the beam. And let's assume it's bending the beam like this. Not so strong. Let me try to reach all that. Not so strong. And uh, actually, redo this, sorry. Okay, you also know that the beam coming from the tip going through the center of the lens 
it's also a straight line. In this case, let's redraw the beam a little bit to make sure you can cross. Oh. Yeah, sorry about it. <laughs> Uh, question. Uh, so the uh, the arrow is just like the diameter of the tip. You you can you can view the arrow as the radius instead of diameter because okay. um, ideally it should be something like this. Okay. But okay. we're using because it's uh, axial symmetric, so we can just use an arrow. Any other questions? This is this illustration is not difficult to. Uh, it's not easy to draw. I'll, I'll try to do that well, so you can see the uh, the difference very soon. Okay, this is pretty good. So what this does is it forms a virtual image here, which you do not capture. So you see the point here. And this is called the virtual image. And from the virtual image, we need to keep forming the image. Then what you have is, again, you learn or use a different color from the tip through the center. It will be a straight line. Okay, it's good enough, I think it's good enough. And uh, the one goes straight down, will be bent by the objective lens. And still converging to a point. And this is the image you see, let me draw that. Does this ray diagram somewhat make sense? It's all high school physics. If no, if no questions, let's move on to what if we strengthen the, uh, the condenser lens. So let's, on the left, let's say weak condenser lens. On the right, let's say strong condenser lens. The first part is pretty much the same. So we find the optical axis, it goes all the way down like this. And from that point, the beam goes down like this. Now, since we have a stronger condenser lens, is that going to bend the beam more or less? If we have a stronger lens, is that going to bend the beam more or less? Will the beam so look something like this? Or the world beam, will, will the beam look something like this? The first case or the second case? If, if we have a stronger condenser lens, Anyone? It's supposed to be the second. Second one. Very First. good, very good. If we, have, if we have a stronger condenser lens, it bends the beam more. So let's do that. Let's show that properly. Okay. And uh, let's also draw the beam across the center. Now, the virtual image is above 
or is higher than the previous case. So this is the virtual image. And let's switch to magenta. Keep drawing the, uh, the ray diagram. So from the top through the center of the, uh, of the objective lens, we draw a straight line. Use the straight line function. Not bad. Uh, let me just. Okay. And when the beam from the point travels straight down, it will bend again. It will be something like this. Let me go that in a less classic way. Okay, and this is your true image. So which probe is smaller? The one on the left or one on the right? Right one. Yeah, exactly. So the top part above the condenser lens, everything's the same. The only thing we changed is the strength of the condenser lens. By making the condenser lens stronger, we bend the beam more and we get a smaller spot size or get smaller probe size. As we mentioned before, since it's axiosymmetric, so the real probe size is actually twice what we have here. Use different color. So this is the probe size. Now we just learned something very new. One effective way to improve your resolution is actually to strengthen your condenser lens. If you have some smaller features you want to resolve, you can just strengthen the condenser lens to achieve a better resolution. Any questions about this? Uh, so yeah, when you proceed and draw the magenta arrows, uh, which one is coming from the... Um, yeah, so the second magenta uh, line is coming from which uh, uh, are, you referring line, to, I would say. are you referring to this line? Yeah, so once you, yeah, once you draw the virtual image, how are you uh, deciding what direction are they going? Um, this now becomes a point source. So you can kind of view there are, there's just light coming out all, in all directions from this source. Let, let, me, let, me go to, uh, let, me, let me go to the next page and uh, draw something we learned back in high school. I hope this will, uh, will make sense. So just okay. one sec. Okay. So assuming like, you know, that's a person standing here. Okay. And this is the optical axis. And we have the lens here. If we look at the head, like the person, assuming the head is like, you know, giving off light, it goes in, in all directions. Something we know is this is the center of the lens. Something we know is the light coming out from the head to the center, to the center of the, uh, the lens is not bent. Hopefully, sorry, it's difficult to draw on the, uh, on the iPad. I'll see whether I have a ruler.
Okay, hopefully that kind of makes sense. And the light coming out straight, kind of like parallel to the optical axis, then it will bend. The level of bending depends on the strength of the lens. Then if this is the lens, uh, the strength of the lens, the image you get is something like this. This is the same kind of like same principle of what we have had here. We only focus on two beams. One is the one going through the very center of the lens and another beam or another ray we see is coming parallel to the optical axis. Using these two beams, we can construct what the image looks like. Does this answer your question? Yes, that makes sense, thank you. Okay, cool. Okay, so, so far it seems by increasing the, the, the strength of the uh, condensed aperture, uh, it seems to be really good, but is that always good? Let's introduce a concept called condensed aperture. Where condenser aperture is at is you have the condens condenser lens up here. So this is the condenser lens. I just used CL for the abbreviation. This is the center. Okay. And down here, you have the condenser aperture. So this is, let's call CA condenser aperture. If we have like weak condenser lens, so weak on the left, all we have is we have the, uh, we have the uh, filament, not virtual image, the filament. And this is the optical axis. Okay. And we'll just go through the center. This part will, will not change. Let's draw the second ray, the second beam, parallel to the uh, uh, optical axis. And if we have something weak, we'll go like this. So this is how the electrons will project. Let's look at the second example where we have a strong condenser lens. Try to show that in a similar way. And we have the condenser aperture here. We have the same size filament. And this is the optical axis. Again, the beam going through the center of the lens is unchanged. It will be the same. But when we strengthen the condenser, condenser lens, this will bend the beam a lot more. And let's just draw the exaggerated case. That's the electron beam. In this case, in this case, if we just move this slightly, the condenser up just slightly. In the left case, it allows more electrons to pass. That's when we have a weak condenser lens. In the second case, we have a strong condenser lens. So the aperture will block part of the electron beam. 
so it allows less. Electrons to pass. What's the direct consequence of that? In the case on the left, we have more electrons going through. But in the second. You have a clear image? Very good, very good, very good. What is the uh, technical way, like more technical way? to describe what, what you just said. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Uh -huh. is, it, is it like less noise? Excellent. So the one on the left with the weaker condenser lens, you will have high signal to noise ratio. So S and R stands for signal to noise ratio. The one on the right will have low signal to noise ratio. If we just summarize what we learned in the first 30 minutes, so just to summarize, what happens when we increase the condenser lens? So stronger condenser lens will have two effects on your images. The first is you get improved resolution. because you can generate a smaller probe. However, you do have sacrifices. The biggest sacrifice you make is poor, poorer signal to noise ratio, noise ratio. That's why like in the lab last week, I mentioned when doing SVM, we are finding the middle ground among different compromises. If you try to improve resolution by increasing the condenser lens strength, then you sacrifice the signal to noise ratio. When you are doing research using SEM, you ask yourself, is signal to noise ratio is more important or the resolution is more important? Then you can make a judgment. Any questions about the strength of condenser lens? We'll have a closer look in today's lab. If no questions, let's move to the second important thing called working distance. You've seen a little bit of that already in the lab. Let's use asterisk. Working distance is defined by the distance from the objective lens to the specimen. Let's again draw the uh, ray diagrams. So we have the electron gun on the top. We have the condenser lens. We have the objective lens. Writing paper is much easier than writing on glass. Okay. And in the first case, we have a short working distance. So this is our specimen. Uh, that's annoying, so I'll just disable that. So this is the condenser lens. This is the objective lens. Okay. And let me just copy what we had here. Okay. So on the left, we have short working distance. I'll just call W 
t as walking distance. So this is w t. In the example on the right, I'll move this tail by quite a bit. So this has large walking uh, large walking distance. And the, the block we have here is the sample. It's pretty clear, like in the second case, the sample is far away from the objective, uh, from the objective length. That's why it has a larger working distance. Then how does working distance affect the trope size, the, uh, the resolution? Let's do what we did before. So just choose the optical axis. Going straight down. Okay. Should be good enough. And assume this is the size of the, uh, the probe. Then again, let's draw a straight line across the center. Draw the parallel par parallel line to the optical axis. In this case, the condenser lens in both systems, both cases. They have the same strength, so they will bend in the same way. Or try to do that as consistently as possible. That gives you the virtual image here. And starting from here, you will be magenta. Okay, and the horizontal, sorry, the vertical one. Okay, and this is your final size of image. Let's look at the example on the right. So let's draw a straight line connecting the center. Okay. Then parallel to the optical axis. Let's try to bend it as much, like in a similar way to the first case. That's close enough. So the virtual image is somewhere here. So very similar to the first case. Now, Let's look at the second part. So if we're connecting the top of the, uh, the filament image in the virtual image to the center of the objective lens, it's actually bigger than, than the specimen. So let me extend the specimen a little bit. That's our specimen. Then if you draw a beam parallel to the optical axis and it will convert here to form a focus beam. Okay. And in this case, the probe is that much the size. If we extend what we learned just now, um, it's axial, uh, axial symmetric, so you'll be twice the distance, twice the distance. Okay, so by looking at the working distance, which one gives you a smaller probe, which one like uh, does gives you the uh, um, better resolution, the one on the left or the one on the right? Left. The one on the left. So reduced working distance results reduced spot size. And this gives you better resolution. Therefore, the second way, the second way you can improve the resolution is to reduce the working distance changing the condenser length system, uh, sorry, con ch uh, change the condenser length strength, changing the working distance, those are very cheap options. You don't have to buy very expensive optics. You don't have to buy super big sources. By playing with those parameters, you can achieve better resolution. For condenser length, this is to reduce, sorry, this is to strengthen the condenser length. For working distance, it is to reduce the working distance. 
any I, questions? Uh huh. Um, I know with certain SEMs, they usually have a um, mount your sample and then raise the the specimen um, stage to like a certain height, and then you start everything. Is that like because it's optimized for the machine that it's like best at that that working distance? Um, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is some uh, technical staff, they are worried students may crash the specimen <laughs> into the instrument. So that's why like for simplicity, they say you can only work at that specific working distance. <laughs> so uh, that's the first reason. Okay. Um, the, the second reason is if the instrument also has focus ion beam, like BIP in it, then there is a concept called coincident point. So mm. when you rotate the specimen at that point, the sample will not wobble. It actually chills. Uh, the area you're looking at in both SEM and in FIB will remain the same. So you can tilt 55 degrees to the pibbing, tilt back to zero degrees, and you're still at exact same location. You can see how the, the meaning has been going on. That's the, uh, the second reason. Uh, the third reason is for some SEMs, um, maybe you simply do not have the, the control of working distance. All the optics are designed based on a specific working distance. Mm -hmm. So those are the three major reasons. In most of the cases, if you use CAT scan, Zeiss, or FEI instruments, you have the freedom. But if you work, like if you use a super, super, super small working distance, you have to be very careful to make sure you don't crash into the, uh, into the, uh, the microscope. You don't damage the hardware. One okay. of the work I didn't get involved into, but uh, I was watching, um, was someone was doing very nice SEM images on nanoparticles. The nanoparticles, the nanoparticles are five to 10 nanometers in size, which are extremely small. Then he brought the specimen about one millimeter working distance to the pole piece. So it's so close. If your sample has height variation, there is a possibility your sample may smash into the instrument. But the resolution is simply amazing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Cool, no worries. Any other questions about working distance before we move on? Okay. When we, reduce, when we reduce the working distance, it's not free lunch. It comes along, there comes along some sacrifices. So let's introduce a concept called depth of field. The definition or description for depth of field is the ability to have non-flat features in focus. I'll give you the conclusion now and we'll walk through the, uh, the ray diagrams by reducing, the depth, uh, by reducing the working distance, you actually sacrifice the depth of field. In many cases, the surface we want to look at are non-flat. This is very important. For example, if you look at powders, it's not flat. If you're looking at fracture surfaces, these are not flat. Let me just use one example, uh, not in microscope, rather in, in camera optics. So assume we have a, we have a, a tree, which is non-flat. Blue uh, should be okay. Okay, so this is our tree, 
or if you want, you can call it like a broccoli. Then we have a lens here, like a super big lens. And we have screen on the other end. So this is screen. Sorry. On the screen, we want to form like a point along the uh, optical axis. If we draw the, uh, the beam diagram from a point source, we'll come out like that. And going through the lens, it will cross here. Assume, assume this is the resolution. It can be anywhere, let's just assume here. Then due to symmetry, we'll have the same lens here. Everything you see within this cone or with these two cones will be in focus. And this is called depth of field. DOF. Let's have a closer look at what happens at the focal point. Assume we have resolution like this. So this is the resolution will use this randomly drawn line to say this is the resolution. Let's look at two types of beams. In the first case, we bend the beam not much. So it crosses like this. Okay. So this, the, the line I draw is about two thirds of the, uh, the grid here of the, uh, the, the lines on my iPad. So let's just translate. Actually, let me just copy that. It will be easier. Copy. Anything within the cone, or anything within, kind of like a, like a bow tie. Anything within here. The differences are so small, you cannot resolve. It's beyond the resolution limit. So everything within will be in focus. This is DOF. Everything outside are not in focus anymore because you can easily resolve them. Let's look at the other example if we have beam crossing like this. And let's paste. If the beam comes in at very large angles, then only very short distance, very small areas, these will be in focus. And everything outside will be out of focus. So this is your DOF, depth of field. Does this kind of make sense? If you have the beam coming in at small angle, you have a large depth of field. If you have beam coming in at a very large angle, if I highlight here, this is what we are looking at. 
then we'll have a shallow, we'll have a slow depth of field. Let's look at walking distance again. What does it mean by changing the walking distance? Let's use the, uh, the tree example. That's the tree here. Similarly, we have the same tree here. Okay, so we have the uh, lenses. And the screen. The, the, the distance between the screen and the lens, they are set the same. So in the first case, that's what we had just now. This is the optical axis. Again, assume maybe half length of the, the between the two lines. That's the resolution. This will be our depth of field. In the second case, in the second case, so this is the resolution. In the second case, let's keep the distance of the screen and the lens the same. Okay, roughly the same, roughly the same. Let's show the, uh, the optical axis. To focus on this point, the beam comes at much shallower, much smaller angle. A bit difficult to draw. In the second case, in the second case, you can see the two beams, they come in at a much smaller angle. And again, half the distance of the, uh, the two lines, everything inside will be in focus. So this is your DOF. How do we link this to what we learned just now in terms of working distance? In the first case, you can see the tree is close to the uh, to the lens, so this one has a shorter working distance. In the second case, you can see the trees far uh, it's further away it's farther away from the, uh, the objective lens. So in the second case, it's longer working working distance. By increasing the working distance, you actually gain the depth of field. So a lot of things that's up and down, those non-flat features, they can be in focus simultaneously. Let's summarize this as well. So working distance, so summarize. If we reduce the working distance, resolution uh, improves. But, but we sacrifice the depth of field. Um, I didn't finish everything I wanted to talk today, but uh, let's finish now.
we'll continue discussing the, uh, the lenses system in the next class. Before we wrap up and go to the lab, any questions? Uh, I have a question. So when we in, uh, increase the working distance, so the resolution is supposed to decrease, right? Uh, resolution the resolution increase. So the probe size decreases. So let me just write that down. Probe size decreases. Um, that corresponds to an improved resolution. Well, yes. Uh, yeah, but when we increase the working distance, resolution decreases so in the that two images that you draw uh -huh. are the resolutions are the same or are, uh, are you referring to this example here like down here yeah yeah i mean it's related to that but uh about actual depth of field so Depth of field is the is about is related to working. Uh, sorry, resolution, right? Uh -huh. resolution, resolution does not change in in both in both of the cases. The resolution I set to be half the width of the uh, the lines in the book, so the resolution does not change. Hmm. Okay. Like uh, I wouldn't say resolution does not change. Uh, kind of assuming, like this okay. is the limit. Assuming okay. resolution does not change. Okay. All then. Right you get a much improved depth of field. Um, you, you will see that if you are looking at uh, some really non-flat materials, by going down, lowering the state, increasing the working distance, a lot of things will be in focus. If you bring the sample closer, 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 you can only make certain things in focus. Many other things are out of focus. Okay, I understand, thanks. Okay, cool. Any other questions before we start the other lab session? I want to quickly recap again what we discussed today. Um, for strength of condenser lens, increasing the strength of the condenser lens, you have improved the resolution, but degraded uh, signal to noise ratio. For working distance, by reducing the working distance, you get improved resolution, but degraded depth of field that's the takeaway message I want you guys to have at the end of today's class. 